Well, hi, everyone. Welcome back to Real Talk with Jen and Mary. This is our third time doing this, and hopefully there will be more. We're going to jump right into the first question. We got a lot of questions from uh, the audience that registered, so we're going to do a few, and then we'll do more. And feel free to put questions into the chat. Okay, first question. I joined this company because the GC said he or she cared a lot about change, but now I don't feel supported when trying to make change happen. Should I just leave? No. You guys, we're not supposed to say guys in 2023. People, no, I don't think we should just leave. I think that once you're in the door, we talked about this offline recently. Once you're in the door, it's a one to three year journey to build a story with your GC yeah. and with his directs or her directs and teach them even what this is about. It's it's not instant. Well, you and I have talked about the fact that we we think the best practice is to be at the leadership team table and to have a voice and have a GC that backs yes. you. But the reality is your GC, your CLO is focused on really big things and they hired yes. you to take care of it. So great if they're going to have your back, but if they don't, that just puts more pressure on you, but it can still be done. I mean, I think both of us have been in that situation where you just have to push, make things happen and prove your worth and do it the hard way without the authority. It's a journey. Yeah. You're saying it's a journey. You experienced that at Google. I'm journeying in my current role at Netflix journey in the past few roles as well. When I started at Cisco and when I left Cisco, maybe that was a five to seven year run because of acquisition, where my leader of legal ops and tech was, Steve Harmon at that point and at that, those two endpoints was very, very different. different. And it's proving the value over time. So get on their calendar, find out some top of mind things. If he or she doesn't have that time, find their direct report yes. in their staff who does, who wants to be the executive sponsor, who's leading the transactional team and they're drowning in inefficiency and start finding those wins there and then take them back to your CLO or GC and give it one to three years. I mean, that's what I do. I, I dig deep and I go drive slow and I enjoy that scenery for a while because this work it's transformation work. It's not yeah. quick win work. And it does take those years, I think, to build the story. It's building the relationships, figuring out how to get stuff done without someone mandating it. How, you know, do you have influence in, in your department that you can get around your yeah. cause or whatever it is? And they want to see that. And they, yeah. they're listening for that outside of your one on one with them. So you get to work on that. Now, look, make sure you have CLO GC buy in when you walk through the door. They have to want this yeah. for this to be successful. You're allowed to ask for that. But what does that look like week to week, month to month? That's a that's up to you and him or her or their leadership. And you might be saddled up with one of the deputy GCs. Great. Stick with them and they will help you work in that triangle way with that leader. You can still make a lot happen without yeah. your GC telling everyone to do exactly what Jen says yeah. when she arrives. I mean, that's just not realistic. No, don't quit before the miracle. I know we get impatient, but yeah. I think this work takes years to unfold. Yeah. And I'll, I'll just tell you all, I came into Netflix, like there was a roadmap in front of me of years time. I was yeah. like five minimum to crack into the foundation to dig down before I can't go anymore. I gave it that much time because I knew I'm not coming here to do an NDA tool. I'm yeah. coming here to move a mountain from there to there. And it takes so much time and patience and endurance to get yeah. there and listening and getting to know people and getting yourself to be known and trusted. That's also that's, a journey. That's a journey. Okay. Next question. Some still see legal ops as a glorified office manager. We know <sighs> that too well. Um, how can I change that reputation to focus on the right kind of work? Stop office managing. Yeah. It's it's I mean, tough. You got to push back on some things. Look, you got to push back. But if you're, when I started this role in 2008, nine, I went from office manager into paralegal contracts manager. And so I still had some of those tasks and I, I couldn't escape that for a while, but yeah. set goals for yourself. Give it a few quarters or go, maybe by this time next year, I can map all that work out to the right person, the right resource, right. someone else who's hungry in the office and wants full-time employment, right? Maybe that receptionist who is a temp, right? A contingent worker wants to come in, groom them, work with them, mentor them, have combos with your leadership, but 
give it time to phase those things out because if the office goes to goes to hell and that was your task that people will be upset and i don't know you can win hearts with office management you in can, the beginning but i do think you have to very quickly start prioritizing your work and getting yes. to the right stuff so that you establish yourself as a strategic partner and not 100%. the person that all the crap work goes to 100 percent, right? and that's a line in the sand moment uh you have to draw and i think this is an opinion and fast and early yeah. this is an opinion but i think we legal ops people have too many hats sometimes and it's okay to not wear all the hats i think you show yourself as a prioritization machine, as a strategist, when you can start saying no to right. the certain things over time. Someone said to me recently, oh, the legal all hands is happening. I'm like, yeah, cool, great, finally, back in person. And they're like, are you planning that? I'm like, no, no, there, I, there are wonderful staff in my legal group who plan that. Who am I to run an event? Like, I'm better at an API. You want me thinking about, with my team, the API connection or something? And I, I don't wear that hat. Sure, if there was no one to do the job, I, I would wear the hat and I would start with that legal ops, many hats, I can do anything, but don't be afraid to do the three things you do super well, and then do the plus one or plus two things outside of that. Finance, outside council management is not my, I'm not a finance person. You really cut your teeth in finance. When I came in to Netflix, I was like, okay, we should do that as a function. This department needs it, not my strength, but let me scope it in and, and I hired for it. Mm -hmm. So reach for the things that have big impact and make you mildly uncomfortable. Yeah. So some advice I gave to someone recently who came to me with this question <clears throat> was you should go to your leadership team and beginning of the year, end of the year, great time to have this conversation. Yeah. Here, here is where all my time is spent. I'm spending time doing this, the all hands, the internet, whatever. And here are the big yeah. milestones, the big impact projects that I, I think we should be focused on, where I should be putting my time. And I'm not able to do that because I'm being dragged down by all this other stuff. Yeah. Do you want me doing all this stuff? Because that's not a good use of my time. And if we agree that we should be focused on the big, big milestones, yeah. then let's let's find other resources or find a way to push back on it. Yeah. Get their support. Show them the trade offs of their own money in investing in yeah. you. I love that. Okay, this is a this is a heated topic. Are you ready? Oh, we're getting heated. Yeah. We're going off the rails. What do you think about matter management? Oh, and geez. what are the guys. best tools for that? Guys. Guys. And a webinar. Thank you for joining. No, I'm just kidding. Matter I management. Hate matter management. <laughs> do not talk about matter management. This is a real talk, so we're gonna we're gonna talk real. Matters are very <sighs> important. That's an important entity. That's how a lot of legal folks organize work and engage with the firm. So I don't think matter death to the matter or that they can't organize that well, way. No one even knows what matter management it's is. It's, code, like it's can, legal code word for no, project. Exactly. No one can even define it. Legal code word for project. So, yeah. so I believe in it as the, the art of organizing the work and we create matters. Yes. And then they move through some of those systems very well, like an e-billing system. But I, the, the whole, the, the technological data practice of matter management all the way from when you engage the firm, it opens the doc management repository, yeah. it, assign, it tags, it, it assigns it. you, there's the your lawyers are in it all day. I have, not I have not happen. achieved that yet. <laughs> Call me a bad legal ops person, but I think it is department dependent and culture dependent. Yeah. And it might be a su super strong law firm topic. I, I'd never know. I've never worked in a law firm. Maybe it works there. Maybe it works in like legal departments that have had ops around for 20 years. But it's the idea of having a centralized system where all your lawyers are working in it day to day. Let's, they're not let, going let's talk to. about a centralized system <laughs> where all your lawyers are going day to day. But, I, my, not, I would guess my legal folks use 10 to 12 different systems in a day. It from, depends on their practice. Right. From yeah. our stack to the company's stack of tech. Uh, cent central. Yeah. So the level of effort needed to move them into something yeah. centralized is not going to be great for them as an experience. Yeah. They're going to be annoyed by it. Does it give you better data? Yes. Well, let me but caveat this for our audience who doesn't necessarily know our legal department sizes that you and I are shuddering from. How large was Google legal wise and policy wise when you left? Uh, when I started, it was 200. When I left, 1500. That that is Huge, massive. massive. And massive. and how big was your team? It was you when you started and, and 50? 60. 60 when you left. And you didn't get to everyone. 
Oh, no. no. Like, no. there were hard like, to your no's. Point, the journey, the, tw- the 10 the year, journey. 13 year journey, we barely scratched the surface of what we could have done. Yeah. When I was at Cisco, it was a 500 to 1,000 person legal department. Tamburg was five people. Spotify was oh, 75 to 150. Netflix is 500 plus to 1,000. These are big groups. Yeah. And it's not as, I, I, I appreciate legal intake systems for when you're in a smaller scale department. Yeah. Not, I'm not knocking that. If you can get that in, get it in. But that's, I don't. I, I agree. I can't touch that I, for a while. I also think like, hello, I work at Ironclad. CLM hello. is a matter management system for your contract. Yeah, it is. So why move them into something else? I also think intake, like you said, is, is super important. Yeah. Intake, assignment, tracking gives you data. You probably have systems, matter management systems for your contracts, for your IP, for yeah. your litigators, for your corporate team. And then there's like a long tail, as I call it, of advice and counsel that doesn't have proper intake. And if you can get that to work, that's great. But also level of effort in trying to get to that and the impact of measuring the last 10, 5% of your work. I mean, hard. Yeah. Hard. Is it, is it worth it? But my new ethos in the last few years has been put tools where the people are and they're in their inbox yeah. and they love Microsoft Word and a few others. I, I want to try to get tooling in there. So they're one yeah, click away. A better experience for them. I can't right? pull them out. Pull them I can't push, be like, now you're going to get everything through a ticketing. I, I'm not there yet. That to me, it's funny. It's the first thing, like how to engage legal, but I'm with this size department, I'm going for that last yeah. because it's hard to prove the ROI at that now i got to get these big foundational pieces in yep okay so the next one is related what about document management because lawyers are constantly saying we don't even have document management management. which makes it sound like it's a basic building block of the tech stack i'm ready to do burpees rather than do doc (laughs) management and i don't like burpees to be clear i feel very strongly about about burpees or do you about both but do you do you do burpees when you work she does burpees when she works Document management is great at a law firm, and that's yeah. why the lawyers think it's going to be great in house. Yeah. But it's a different model, and it just is really hard to make it work. And I just don't love it as as a priority. That was a big fail for you at Google. And I don't even Eric, think we needed it, Eric, frankly. Eric, there, there it is. The problem is every single lawyer you talk to is like, we don't even have document management. We need document management. But what you need to do as legal ops is inform them, this isn't a law firm. It's going to be different. There's no forcing mechanism yeah. for people to put stuff in. Yeah. So. Now, there are caveats. And I don't, this isn't a prescription to say none of you do DM. Right. You had G Drive before it was even uh, a enterprise offering you guys had that sure. as your tech stack at google that is a shared shareable drive you can create team drives etc you can collab on docs that's a 70 percent of dm's uh, capabilities so to create a redundant drive that does it in a more rigid way the legal workflow way and to peel them off g drive and slow things down nothing integrated with g drive yeah. then they try to now they're doing an okay job you're starting to create redundancy right but if you're coming into an environment and there's no G drive and there's no box and there's no SharePoint and there's no enterprise content management solution, I can see why you may go with DM. I do know of big successful tech companies who have DM and, and they love it. Yeah, it can work. It's just really hard. It's hard. It really hard to make it work. It's hard. If anyone is from Netflix listening, <laughs> you know how hard it is. These flowers are for you and more to come on that in a memo in Q1. All right. How do you start a big transformation project? Oh, I got this question recently in my LinkedIn DMs uh, from a, a one of our peers in London, and we're going to talk next week about it. How do you start a big transformation? A capital T yeah. transformation project at the beginning. You just start. You just start. And sometimes, I mean, my whole portfolio where I am now is a big transformation project starring 7,000 lowercase t transformation products, uh, projects. So you might start with a series of the things you have to clear out the gate in terms of projects. But first and foremost, with a big transformation project, you have to construct a vision of where we're headed and write a strategic narrative that you can tell to any group in your legal or finance departments or all of the above that 
in their language that they understand, like universal story yeah, know language. Know your stakeholder. Know your stakeholder. So you might have to write two or three different versions of a strategic narrative that gets you to the same vision destination place. If you don't have that, forget it. Transformation is a journey and you need story to get there. I read in a book recently about transformation, which we can share in the show notes, um, strategic or, or story, the power of narrative can change a person at the neural level, like a story can change you at the neural level. I mean, do you remember the first time you saw like the little mermaid? I was neurally changed, right? Like <laughs> these that, powerful <laughs> stories, but all, all, all the Disney <laughs> stories drawn, all the classics, they're all off. They're all King Lear or Sha uh, some form of Shakespeare, Romeo and Juliet. Under the These are age old stories. They're hundreds of years old and they really move you. Find the story in the work, use analogy, use metaphor, borrow those. I go off on such analogies. I use Gray's Anatomy as a doc management buy-in analogy when I was selling the UK film team again on why we need document management because they're like, I'm not sure I understand why. And it was all slides with Meredith Gray. And I was like, look, if you hate I manage or doc management or whatever we're putting in, that's okay. You'll tell me that and we'll pivot and move on. And it, and the, the truck came and hit Derek and my slides and took him out. Yeah. I, Go I, for the gold. I think storytelling is the number one skill you need in this work because you have to tell this story over years. And that is the first thing out the gate to be checked on, on the box. Would you agree? I, well, I would disagree with the use of Meredith Gray. I would rather look at pictures of Derek Shepard. However, I also think the transformation, like number one, find your stakeholders. Yes. The other thing I would say is figure out your culture and how your company yes. works. Like, if you are lucky enough to have the GC mandate, fantastic. Your life is easy for yes. transformation. If it's not that easy and you do you have a lot of dissenters, do you have small groups that are really yeah. Uh, hungry for change and like yeah. find those people work with them sometimes you have to start small and you know land and expand as we say yeah. figure out how to make success for one group make everyone get fomo because that group is doing really well Use and FOMO. data and do awesome and point to them as like the shining star and they all get promoted and then all the other lawyers will want that should be the invisible have. 13th clock core What's that? Use FOMO. Use FOMO. Use FOMO. FOMO. Is very powerful. It's it's powerful because we're all in business environments where everyone is type A and wants to win and perform. Especially and lawyers. They're especially very competitive, lawyers. right? We all want to please the boss who wants to please the boss who wants to please the shareholders. Yeah. So you can create fun, competitive, incentivized competition sure. between them and go, well, that team's using this. Don't you want to? And that will create, it'll challenge them to want to innovate and keep up with the Joneses, yeah. so to speak. So big transformation, there's a lot of ways to do it. You can start small, you can- Start really small, get your story mapped, run that story with people, run it with your boss before you show it to all the leaders and rehearse that thing. I, I tell this yeah. a lot, I rehearsed my first story uh, 250 times and I needed three months to form that story. You have to sit in the environment and you said this, you have to learn the language of mm -hmm. your environment. I had to learn the nomenclature of Spotify so different than Cisco. If I spoke like I spoke at Cisco, they'd be like, who, what is this gibberish? Yeah. So I needed time to be quiet and sit in meetings and just absorb and be very tired at night. Do that. So you have the nomenclature yeah. of transformation in that particular environment. Just another tip that I uh, just remembered. Don't go around asking people what they want no. and what they want the future to look like, no. because you will only disappoint people when they feel heard and then you can't deliver on what they want. So I, I like to always change the way we ask questions and say, what's working well for your team? What could be better? And do we agree that it could be better than it is today? And if you get them there, at least you have a starting point for the conversation of like, where can we go? Mary, I think what you're trying to say is don't go chasing waterfalls. Please exactly. stick exactly. to the rivers and the lakes that you're used to. <laughs> it's just, it's not a day if that song doesn't course through my veins. All right. Okay. Okay. How and we're in my studio. So we, uh, before, <laughs> before the camera came up, I was like, Mary, look at this, look at this pop song I just wrote. And then I played you the ironclad jingle. This is a very impressive studio. That I wrote yeah. when I was with ironclad up north in California on a shoot. And will you just sing it? So the, the <laughs> jingle, I'm not going to sing for you all, but the jingle lyric is you should all buy ironclad. <laughs>
Okay, so but we'll, it said really we'll, cutesy in like a State Farm Barry Manilow yeah. way. It's like you That's should all that. buy Ironclad. And Bing. we'll find a way to release that in a nice. And way. then I wrote a verse in front of Mary J, which was like contracts. <laughs> They're kicking our butts every day, and we, it was fun. Okay, okay. back to uh, back to the the webinar. Yeah. Um, how do I find a legal ops mentor? How do you find a legal ops mentor? You could. Just ping me. Just just ping Mary. <laughs> I'll Mary talk to you. Mary's <laughs> taking mentees. Uh, she is a mentor to the lot. legal ops universe. How many mentees do I you even countless, have? Countless. Yeah, you don't even count because yeah. do you do it in a structured way or is it like ad hoc? Or, no, uh, people just go, Can I take 20 minutes of your time? I'd like to so you'll do like, I have a challenge or I'm trying to work through you'll something. You'll do like a one a one session. Yeah. And what if someone comes to you and goes, I want you to be my my like mentor, D yeah, digging yeah, in, yeah. you'll you'll do ongoing. Yeah. That's awesome. Absolutely. So just ping Mary, Mary at. No, but just realistically. Ping. How do you how do you find a mentor? Look, sometimes you have mentors where you formally say, I need you to mentor me. Sometimes it's like open-ended or just I need you to get me through these four sessions or to this next milestone on a project or career move. Sometimes you have a mentor and they don't know you're they're they're mentoring you and but it's just a show up once in a while. And I don't know. I think with mentors. Someone wrote in my inbox on LinkedIn recently, I want you to be my mentor. You do ABC. You seem cool. And then the next paragraph, here's what's in it for you. And I have to tell you, I was really moved by oh. that sentence because I have to make trade-offs with my time yeah. all the time. And when someone's showing me what's in it for me, I'm like, how can I get him to work on one of my many fun projects? That's yeah. where my mind went. And then we can have maybe an ongoing collab here or there. So offer that to people. It's not just about you. It should be a two way thing. That's right. Reach out cold on LinkedIn, shoot your shot, as they say, find them at all the conferences and events mm -hmm. that we do. I think finding a way to be of service to people, um, like you were all mentoring me as the clock founders. We, we want people were, to succeed. I mean, so do you, right? Yeah. We want everyone in this world to do well. I would show up to early clock institutes and be kind of quiet and nerdy and be like, Mary, I built the app. And then I would like sh go back in my corner and build tech with Farhad. And you were mentoring me just by power of your presence, how you showed up, how you spoke, the double string pearls, everything. So sometimes it's not so formal and I wasn't taking right. your time it have to be formal. Yeah. So show up places and be of service and contribute something you've got and you can work in with people in a really organic way. Yeah. And not everyone can be your mentor. I think yeah. it it's, can't be forced. Like I can't match you with someone, yeah. but for myself and looking for someone to mentor me, like if you tell them what's yeah. going on and they actually look like they care yeah. and they're trying to put themselves in your shoes and give you real advice, like that's who you want. Um, okay, last of the the formal questions, and then we'll do a rapid fire round. This is uh, what's keeping you energized this year? What's different about this year, given given us excitement? <clears throat> what is keeping me energized this year? I'm just feeling like there's momentum. You know, there's there's still more legal ops is like growing. There's oh, yeah. more We're people talking there. about transformation. Transformation is affecting the entire organization, not just legal anymore. So yeah. we're hearing every legal department is feeling pressure from the rest of the company yeah. to transform, which is great because it's been static for so long. Not to be savage and like hyped on the negative, but when the markets go down, that is our time to shine and rise and shine, as Kylie Jenner once said, uh, in, in our roles, because we are all a part of the solution of better budgets, operating at scale, more efficiency, helping them decide, do you invest in a tech versus a headcount onward? Um, now's the time, not the good times. So that keeps me energized yeah. and I get like, oh, watch, watch yeah, this and, and show it even more. And all the, that data we've been harvesting behind tools for a few years and the da ability to dashboard it and show it, we just started putting those up in front of people this year after a year of tough markets at mm -hmm. all companies. And all of a sudden, everyone's like, "I need that. I need that now. I'm, I'm, I'm at, I'm pushed to the brink." So that keeps me really excited. Um, the studio we're sitting in right now, I'm so pumped because I just sound treated it so that I have no more echo. Mm -hmm. There's no boom in this room, and for me to come in here and just create and have that downtime where I'm making things and pushing my own understanding 
is the ultimate recharge for me to do this really hard work. Uh, it's complex transformational work. So awesome. those two things and clock in May has oh, me pumped there. because we are all, we have to make it bigger and better and even more valuable than last year. And last year was really was great. And of course the ironclad party. Okay. The ironclad party. <laughs> Am I invited? Of course you're invited. Am I co-hosting? You're co-hosting. There we it, go. I clock is going to be like welcome back Mary in a big way. It's I'm aw. I'm I'm hearing that's Mary's going to be up in there, up yes. on that Jeopardy board, maybe triple pearls. <laughs> maybe you and I will get lowered in glass boxes and we'll s sing a pop song. No, nah, never mind. We'll okay, so walk. now is the part of the webinar where we're going to go to rapid fire questions. So we're done with the formal questions. And uh, we have a bunch of cards that we we got from the uh, from the audience and we're just going to Pick cards and go through rapid fire answers. Am I? I'm picking a card. First, any card? You pick, yeah, you pick first. And I'll Fifty-two pick card pickup. No. At what point? Okay, show the card. At what point? Look at this SNL handwriting. Mary O'Carroll, <laughs> chief community officer, and she has handwriting like an SNL producer. At what point should a small team automate? Immediately. Immediately. I know. I know a, a party of one, a GC who is a solo GC. There's no one else in the whole department. And the only reason he can continue to scale himself is because he's using technology. Right away. Right and away. you want to automate, you want to routinize, routinize or, and get pushed to automation. Anything that is not core for that GC of one, that GC of one, I'm going to say it. I don't think they should be doing NDAs. This is yeah, just my opinion. Yourself, right? Like create the generator so Start that right he or she can push that out to his sales folks, his business folks and go, you do the NDA. And these are generous enough terms and only come to me when they're for the 5% that need a negotiation. So right there, you're scaling them for potentially one of your highest volume. So do it right away. It's rapid fire. Okay. If you, oh, we got a fun one. If you could spend a day with one Kardashian, who would you choose? Oh. Chloe, obviously, she's the most fun. Chloe? Yeah. Wow. You're not going to be eating and you're going to be working out for nine hours or getting surgery. Chris uh, Jenner, because I think she's got legal ops in her veins. Next. Momager, billion dollar empire. What to do? Legal ops asked to do more with less this year. I mean, is this, this, this should is be every year? This is this our is neck year. tattoo. Let's all get this tattooed on our neck this year and really lock that secure employment with a neck tattoo. Do more with less. That prioritize. Say no. We say every single say time. No. Yeah. Do um, that thing I told you with the GC and tell them. Someone once asked Michelangelo, "How did you create the statue of David?" David, and he said, "Oh, simple. I just took away anything that wasn't David." That is it. Another way of saying <laughs> focus. It's strategy is about the things you're gonna say yes to, but it's more about everything you're not gonna say yes to, that you're gonna say no to. So be bold, Me, my team and I right now are on a very, we're embracing no this year and the not now and saying, can you can you give us a few quarters? We're trying to do more with less. We're trying to execute on our, our three big priorities and stick to things that are like three big or five and like don't do more. What is the best slash most important tool to implement? Well, obvious, obviously. I mean, we're here and it's, <laughs> it's ironclad. No, but but in, in all seriousness, there's a lot of distractions. Like we talked about DMS, we yeah. talked about matter management. There's, I, you're going to get requests for like, I want a report. I want a intranet site. I want to call down like 200 law firms to just 100. None of that is going to make an impact you. And that's not going to yeah. get you promoted. You want to get promoted. Think about what the people in your department are working on it's usually contracts and where where yeah. you make an impact is accelerating deals is affecting revenue is getting oh, procurement that's our neck tattoo done, right or maybe that's like our arm sleeve faster deal times yeah so you could just it. come in with your leadership and be like that that is the metric that's going to get faster you promoted deal times. that's going to make legal look good uh, that makes your gc happy. assuming you're in a deal driven yeah. environment More which many are. you're buying stuff yeah. faster you're that's a competitive edge for the company funny that hard deep also asked what is good contract management software hard deep just a reminder we are on an ironclad <laughs> webinar do we need to sing the jingle again if, do you want me to sing the jingle <laughs> i'll dance it next time in a TikTok <laughs> dance but you should all know the gartner kurt hype the gartner graph came Quad out uh, the quadrant came out what last fall with all the CLM providers and where they're all landing. You guys are on there. Get your Gartner on and see 
who's the latest and greatest and the different quadrants people are accelerating. Just ask your friends. Or call, yes. call us and ask your friends. Pick okay, we're going Pick for another one. Pick a card or any card. Oh, we're getting the good ones. Who is your style icon? Mary O'Carroll, right Kate, here. Kate it, Middleton, duh. It I mean, doesn't get like, more. So I was saying, you're you're my style icon. <laughs> oh, stop. Come, come on. The first time I saw her at clock, I was like, the pearls, the collar? I got to get my act together. Um, Kate Middleton, yeah, what a great me. choice. She's she's beautiful and Classic. very stylish. And she, it's Classic chic. And elegant. And it's understated. Classy. And the lines, everything is so chic, so British, so Clean royal. Lines, yep. My style icon is, I was trying to think of this before. It used to be people who are no longer. They got canceled. That got kind of canceled for being, being, being mean. I thought I had another one. It'll come back to me. For now, Mary O'Carroll. <laughs> okay. Have you implemented a tool you realized was wrong for your department? What do you do then? I mean, you I, rip and replace. And I have made a career yeah. on doing this. <laughs> if you haven't done this, you haven't lived a legal ops life cycle of death. So and what, what do you do though? Let's see. You call it. You call it. It's you, some cost. It's and you you shout it. I think you shout it. You write it up or you slide it up and you tell a story of here's what we thought we were solving for the problem we set out here's what we did here's everything we did if there was a there was a reason probably someone of chose course that, there's right? a reason if there was a mistake in there you just own it and go now i know we should have done that differently and i made the wrong call and it's most important at the end you go and here's what we learned and here's where we're going because we learned that i mean that is silicon valley ethos yeah. half of silicon valley i'm pointing at you up in silicon valley is built off mistakes yeah oh for and sure just Okay, but now you have to pivot. You have to pivot. Sometimes you have to put in a DM solution as a pilot to realize yeah. your your legal thing. department might not want DM in house. This is a hypothetical, but yeah. I'm just saying. But don't pour more money and resources in trying to make something that's dead work. Shout your mistakes. Tell and the story. Move on. Move on quickly. Move on quickly and take those learnings quickly. and go. It's more informed. Yeah, rip, rip off the Band-Aid and move on. Okay. I will. Eddie Slomane is my style icon. He's the creative director right now of Celine. Many of years at YSL. And he's just so cool. He's just, he invented the jacket. Plus, plus I, have I that. tried to convince you to buy that jacket yet? I have. Which one? The, the leather one? jacket. Oh, no, I have the leather jacket. Oh, just, we never have, mind. We have never matching mind. leather jacket. Style icon. Okay. <laughs> what was the game changer in your legal career? What was your game changer? I think the community clock and meeting other people and knowing that I wasn't alone in this struggle and yeah. learning from others and not recreating the wheel. Learn yeah. from others. Yes. Learn from others clock uh, i think i have a, an extrinsic game-changing moment it was when i volunteered to come speak at the first ever new york city clock chapter because i lived in new york at the time and i said i'll do a presentation and i showed up and do you know i rehearsed those slides a hundred times it, well it showed you were so good yeah and i showed up in a room standing room only i was working at cisco at the time and i said hi i'm jen and i'm going to show you everything i've done for knowledge management and what i've discovered over the last few years at cisco and i took you all through you know, the six parts of my KM strategy, which have since become the clock six part KM strategy. Cause we you know, when learned. you, we all learn from you, when you present a clock, what you say becomes clock IP in some sense. And that was great. I gave my framework to clock and said, try it and adapt it to your environments. But I came in that room so ready and so prepared. And all of you were like, who are you? you <laughs> Connie was like, where did you come from? And she said that to me and she's like, are you on TV? And she asked me that too. And you said to me, oh, I hired the wrong person from Steve Harmon's team. <laughs> oh, wow. <That's>, she did. <laughs> yeah. You were like, I should have come for you to run KM and uh, maybe That's TMI. Good. Sorry about That's that. That's right. Hope that person's not listening. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Is there value in in-house certification courses? <gasps> I'm counting backwards from 10. Mary, go first. I think there's value in in-house certification. Yeah, I don't course. even know that what that does exist. Is. I mean, there's just do the job. Just do it, and do Nike. It well, right? Yeah. I mean, and just prove yourself. I don't. I don't think you need a certification. I don't. Think I'm going to say no. And a lot of people ask me this in my LinkedIn DMs and in mentorship scenarios. Should I go get this Master of Legal Ops that they offer somewhere in the state of Pennsylvania? And I'm like, 
I will not co-sign, you know, a hundred thousand dollar or two hundred thousand dollar educational bill that I didn't get that pro. I just went to work at Cisco. I put my head down and I possibly sucked for the first two years and three years and asked for help and let my boss like bring me to my knees sometimes and help me go in a different direction to start like starting a KM program at that size was so hard. Yeah. And I did it. But in the beginning, it was really rough. So I believe that 90% of learning in life is experiential. It's not classroom. Don't do it. Yeah, I, I we, we, we do talk about some skill sets and things that you can learn, like project management skills, and project six, management, six Sigma stuff, and, learn it, yeah. and learn the frameworks, learn them all. Should you go spend, I mean, P, uh, PMI Institute, green belts for Six Sigma, they're not they're cheap. Not cheap. So make a calculated decision. Will someone sponsor you? It's it's cool to have those certifications because that means you can step into any project. You don't even know the outcomes and you know how to run it. And people feel led by you. And I think that's a very powerful mandatory skill set. We're all project managing in the end. How do I gain the confidence, one of my favorite topics, and trust of legal department members? How do I gain the confidence and trust of legal department members? You do something that changes their life and makes their life better, and you, then they want you to come back. Yeah. We focus on the right stuff. It all comes back to prioritizing the right stuff. Yes. I think so much of trust is listening more than mm, you talk. For sure. It's showing up and being able to intake it all and being able to empathically show them you're listening and come back and maybe go, this is what I do a lot. I'm like, is this what you meant? And we do a mock-up. Is this what you meant? Is this what you meant? Mirror what they say back, reframe it. Is this what you meant? And you can start to earn it. Then you have to deliver something. And deliver. then they, when their teams start going, oh, how did I do our job without, without this? You, yeah. Those are the the magic words that yeah. start to unlock the, the rooms on this. Yeah, so you yeah. got to deliver. You have to talk it and walk it and really execute. And again, back to project management. It's such a part of being a fierce project manager means you're delivering something, even if it's wrong yeah. and you earn it. Uh, you own it later. Oh, we got another fun one. What are you reading right now? What am I reading right now? So I texted Mary last weekend. I'm reading your guy, David Goggins. David Goggins is my guy. He just put out his new book and I don't have- That's the... what I'm reading. So never finish David Goggins. Never finish. So I read chapter one while on a spin bike. and uh, I did an audio book and I was in tears with his origin story. Like, holy cow. And I texted you like, Whoa. And you were like, go back and read this first book first. first. Book. So I'm about eight chapters into David Goggins Can't Hurt Me. And then I'm reading a nonfiction book called Say Nothing by an Irish author who wrote a, a riveting tale of the story of the troubles in Ireland from 1970 to 2000. What a compelling time of some of my people, the Irish people, and uh, just a, a woman warrior in there who got was on the wrong side of history, but I love reading women warrior stories, uh, even if they're not winning freedom and from in the end. Wait, did you say what you're reading? The David Goggins yeah, book? Yeah, I'm reading Never Finished. I thought you read like nine books at once. I saw your book list you did with on Courtney's well, LinkedIn read, and you got, uh, yeah. you and Courtney were like, <laughs> I read 79 books in an hour. No, it takes me a really long time. Did, oh, here's my question. I read Pachinko, it was very good. Was it very yeah, good? Was it, it was it great? It was great. Yeah, yeah, I loved it. Pachinko is a rich fictional story. Good, Read it. With so many layoffs, this is a good one. How this is relevant? How to demonstrate the value of legal ops with so many layoffs? <sighs> this, this is the same question. It's yes. it's the prioritize, make an impact, do the right projects, and have the metrics to show it. To have the metrics to show it. Get your legal ops metrics, productivity metrics on. This will save you. This will save your people an hour a day. This will save you the need for a future headcount need of 10. Yeah. Do that math and project it. They hired you to think that way. And then they that gives them some signals to go, okay, maybe we put the money towards that tech investment and we hold back on this next paralegal for now. And you will always hear me talk about the 80%. I always want people to focus on where 80% of the time is spent in your department, not the 20, 
And this is the challenge. Oftentimes when you show up in legal ops, yeah. they're like, hmm, what can we have you do? You know what? It's really hard to find my documents. Get me a DMS. Or, oh, we have too many law firms. Maybe call those down or work on the rate negotiations or do some RFPs or my favorite one. Can you build us an intranet site so we have a place for all our policies? All those things are really great. Intranets. You should do them at some point. Intranets. But if you don't do the right thing first. I did right? so many like, intranet pages. But, but, Jen, who's going to get promoted because you have an internet page? Who gets promoted because all your documents are one place? Nobody. Who gets promoted because you've saved money through law firm management? Nobody. These are all really important things. Like yeah. people care and it's good for your company. But when they come back to like, why are you valuable? No, none of the lawyers are actually rated, you know, or their performance yeah. is based on their, how much money they saved. It's the work that they do. So can you make the work that they so do? better, faster. So you have to show your value by showing the value to, to, the to lawyers, them and, and the clients. A thread I talk about a lot is, okay, we're saving time. So what? We want our folks, our personnel, our staff to be these talent dense roles that all have growth. People are interested, happy, happy satisfied. They feel like they're going somewhere and are a part of the greater mission. Yeah. They're not doing data entry, for example. I do not believe in the great people sitting in the offices around us to be sitting there going like this. They need growth ceilings that move and pull them along and challenge them. And I think a lot of the work we do gives people that 10% of their time back to focus on a higher complex right problem things. for that legal practice yeah. area. And I'm very vocal about that in these times because layoffs are tough times that where everyone gets looked at and they have to make tough calls and you want people who are just densified you they couldn't afford to lay that yeah. person off because they are covering all of this yeah, complex yeah, yeah. negative space for yeah. the department okay looks like we're out of time we're not going to get to all these wonderful questions so we're now going to the live segment where we're taking the questions from we're the going chat. some some audience questions here that have been loaded into the chat what is the best way to get a mentor in legal ops space safia i hope you were on when we hit that Key priorities for this year is legal ops. I'm going to go out on a limb and say it. You heard it this morning, contract management uh, in high volume. I mean, it's the, it's the biggest impact project. In a high have. volume environment. It should environment be the number projects. one thing you focus on, honestly. Can you give a quick overview of what legal ops includes, asks Tara from New Hampshire. I don't know if you're in New Hampshire, but I wish we had cities on here so I could sound like a TV There's radio a, a wheel, the clock wheel. The we'll clock wheel, the clock core has 12 potential things we could focus on. It doesn't mean you have to focus on them all. Here's a yeah. practice area ops is one of the 12 cores. And I'm going to say, I try not to focus on practice area ops at this stage and where I'm enormous. at. That's enormous. It's enormous. If I went in and said, okay, privacy, I'm going to do it all for you. A, I'm not a privacy expert. I'd be doing them a disservice. And B, I might not be able to solve for the many, for that 80%, yes. the contract piece. So I don't go near practice ops right now. I try to support practice ops folks that they may hire. And then over time, we might work more together and our their career could start to shift once we put in a big tech thing together and then they, their roles change. But it's okay to say no. But financial management, I think, is a table stakes. Yep. Contract management, project management, strategic planning, strategic planning help with tech budgets, and tooling. tech tooling, process. Data. Data analytics. Data viz. Those are, I think, table stakes. Let's see. I think they should have put them in order of votes. So should we oh, they're in order yeah. of votes. Okay. So I'm going to go down. I'm seeing legal op certs, but they're expensive. Advantages of these we programs. Answer we answer we answered that a bit. Um, how do you keep legal and vendor management teams on the same page when most software keeps data siloed this is the age-old corporate divide it's it's legal and the contracts it's vendor management the teams and the contracts and i've seen it in past companies where it splits and you have different clms how do you keep them on the same page you mean you have different systems doing the same thing or you just have different systems that don't talk to each other sorry how do you keep legal finance and vendor management teams on the same page when the software doesn't how do you align those teams? That's, I mean, yeah, it's build relationships, right? That's, and, that's a lot of talking, a lot of relationships, a lot of listening and starting really small and showing them, hey, I think I did this at Spotify. I think that we can solve for 
the first 50 metadata fields for you procurement on these contracts, okay? And then they had Coupa in addition to a CLM. So they were gonna do their piece after. And I was like, well, there's an element of a Coupa that made more sense for them mm -hmm. with the invoicing and the ordering that's super financy. Yep. And I don't wanna track that in a CLM. It's not designed for that, as yeah. you know. So partnership, 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 which is so much about relationship. Yeah. What is the difference between a doc management system and the ironclad repository? Three question oh, marks, says Jamie. Such a good question. So this is another area where I get I get very fired up about She's fired up. I, I hate document management as a term because it's also, I, I ask people, okay, why do you think you need document management? What documents are you trying to find? And they go contracts. Okay, well, you have a contract system. That should be your contract repository. The search is intentionally yeah. built to find contracts. Oh, okay, what other, what other documents are you trying to put in there? My patent filings. Okay, you have a patent management system that's built for that. Yeah. So you have systems for all these different documents. Do you need to have another place to like duplicate the efforts so that everyone can find everything? I don't think so. There she goes. If it's Hating working already, why? Why? There's an element of DM that is, it works. And there's, an, in some environments, it may not work. If all of those are in place, there could be some Venn diagramming yeah. or some redundancy or my nightmare is bifurcating their work product yeah. into different places don't know where this is to a point is, where right? their brains melt. Yeah. Like, I don't want them to do yeah. that. Any tips on how to successfully implement a new CLM tool for legal staff physically located in different parts of the world, asks Diana. Road trip. Road trip. <laughs> or in times of budget cuts, virtual road show. Yeah. Uh, having a great story, a great set of slides. We rolled out a CLM at Spotify and everyone was spread between yeah. Europe, Asia, and the States. And we had an airtight deck and we just hit them like clockwork, virtually popped into all their meetings, very clear slides. What's in it for you? What I need you to do next, the plan, the timeline, call to action. And then we went right into action. So a really clear project plan that they can understand that you do not present as a Gantt chart. Never show anyone a Gantt chart except each other in private. I like that. You heard it here first, Diana. What is the comp range for a head of legal? Let's, let's oh. talk about money in a very large company. So very large. What's very large? Google's huge. Uh, look. Google has a million people. No, every has... company is going to have a different comp range because you've got equity, you've got risk sure. taking, you've got small companies, you've got large companies. And then the scope of the role is going to be different based on the size. Of, I mean, are you managing a 60 person team or are you a party of one at a startup? Those are different scope of roles. I like to say, use the benchmark of, let's say what the lawyers are making. Oh, it's spicy. And then let's go she's, up. Let's she's go coming up in spicy. Well, listen, supply and demand. I love how she I, works. I, they would tell me, oh, we need to hire like four more privacy lawyers. Great. They're, I mean, I, please don't let me insult anyone. You can find them. They're a dime a dozen. There's tons of really good privacy lawyers. Now you need to tell me you need to find two really highly skilled legal ops people. Good luck. Spicy. Look, it's hard to find. Let me, so you got to pay up. I love that you have the confidence and bravado to do that. Let me tell I've, between you, me and this camera and a few dozen of you, I wouldn't do that because I just don't. I don't like to pick at with an ax the institution of law. It's just my place. I like, look, I say one inappropriate thing per meeting. Like I have a mouth and sometimes it gets me in trouble. But what I do is try to show them something, build something, automate something. And they go, how the bleep did she do that? And when early on, I heard someone at Netflix say, geez, what you do is like black magic. Yeah. And guess what they'll pay for black magic? Black magic money. I mean, <laughs> you show it through For the sure value. And especially if there's a tech and financial component to it where you're saving, that start, the story beneath can also tell. So I think you can take a slip both paths, one, the other. Um, but the, what do you say the ranges are? I mean, I've seen heads of legal ops in the high 100s at super small startup -y companies. Yep. I've seen the head of legal ops go up to a million. That's just what I've seen. That, and I, I'm, I concur. And That's I'm talking right. with that all in comp, like yeah. the base, the bonus, the stock, Agreed. everything yeah. that I've seen, I've seen it go up that high yep. in this industry. I know people, you too. But yes, but that's, that's the, that's the upper, right? That's, that's like the, the upper. It's like, don't go into your 
Don't use that as a data point. <laughs> don't go to your interview and say, remember Mary when and Jen said, I can you, make a million. Yeah, <laughs> like you have to go into your interviews and ask the questions. You have to understand how they're budgeting the role yeah. first. And you have to be really honest about your market. And have you done the work? And do you have the experience to back any number that you put up? And I can't, I, I see people, we've, we've done a lot of hiring. I see people come oh, along and they shoot themselves in the foot. They say numbers that are, eye popping and you and they may not have the the years of experience directly backing that and i never want to see someone fail yeah. on it on well, a team you i leave also never throw out the first number as a candidate that too don't do that do you see any potential for chat gpt on legal ops ahmad I mean thank you for the question <laughs> Ever, we're all obsessively talking about this on LinkedIn. It's all anyone's talking about. Now. Yes. Have Absolutely. You, what have you good. looked for on chat GPT? Well, oh, personally? Yeah, any, or professionally. Have you done anything done, on there? I've done a lot. I, I, well, well, are I you willing I don't to share? I actually want to say. Why? Is, uh, I plan to use it for uh, my team reviews. Man, oh, wow. <laughs> Performance <laughs> review criteria. You're Thank really you, Chad. I'm that stuff. Sorry, wow. Alex and Seth. And <laughs> Mary, Mary's next it's keynote, a, it's a chat first, GPT. It's a first draft. I mean, obviously, I wow. would put thought and love into it. But, you know, it gives you a really good first draft for a lot of things. I went to chat GPT while in a music that. studio a few weeks ago. I, this is so funny to me. I hope your employees are listening. <laughs> Alex, Sue, are you listening? <laughs> When you get your performance review, go, the robot wrote this, all right? And refuse it, reject it. Um, I use ChatGPT in a fun capacity. I, I was trying to write music lyrics for a pop song. And I said, can you give me some music lyrics for a pop song? And it was giving me... Oh, it's really good. It's good, but it was giving me other people's lyrics. Oh, and no, you have it, to be more specific. I have to sit with it more, and then I just wound up writing my own lyrics. I asked it to write a rap about uh, oh my... God. my cousins visiting san francisco because we were all sitting around the dinner table and they were visiting oh and it like God. wrote a whole thing and it was it was impressive and um, now but it will have for an impact our, on legal and now for our last seven <laughs> minutes mary o'carroll will, will perform the rap that's uh, more your thing no i if you're writing raps it makes me wonder if it's more your thing raps. i don't write raps. GBT is writing raps i write ironclad <laughs> jingles that are really overt you should all buy ironclad Bing. okay uh, we said the number. What are your key priorities? We did that. How can someone transition from the paralegal background and contracts management background to a legal ops manager? Asks Shireen. This is a good one. And we hear this about yeah, this, a lot. this a lot. And even from lawyers, lawyers say, how do I transition from a lawyer to it? If you're already in house somewhere, you're set because you can just start doing start role. doing it. So yeah. I'm, I'm going to do this very soon with one, a mentee I'm working with right now who wants to do exactly this. And next week, we're going to go grab a couple job descriptions from the legal ops lexicon. We're going to grab some of those bullets off that re resonate with things she does now. I'm going to pull them over and then we're going to reform her current paralegal work to sound like uh, it's in the picture frame of legal ops work. Yeah, That's current. And then you can do the same where you look at bullets of the many job descriptions out there and go, what do I want to do? What of these 10 bullets lights me up? Take one of those and go, I'm going to find this. Mm -hmm. I'm going to find this on my own with 10% of my time at work. No one's asking me to do this. My boss didn't task me. I'm going to find this work and do it. Yeah. And then come back and you show that to your manager when it's growth talk time, when it's annual review, uh, what you want in life, your goals for the new year, performance review, boom, put it on the table and go, that one bullet, look what I did. Here's the results. How do I get my role going more that way? If you have results and they, you, they, you show that self-initiative, they're going to go, it's alive. Yeah. So take action, Just take initiative. Just it. start. How have you successfully handled timekeeper rate negotiation increases? Knowing law firms lost profits last year and are trying to recruit, uh, recoup that by gouging in-house legal teams for 2023 asks Tom gouging. That's, that's a, that is an action verb. Are we being gouged? I don't believe we're being gouged. I wouldn't say gouge, but this is a rough economic patch we are in right now. There's been inflation, the markets, I, I just shredded my E-Trade password. I'm like, I don't need to look at that for a while. <laughs> it's not great. 
And so, of course, you'd expect law firms to come in and be like, uh, here's here's our proposals. And some might make your eyes pop. How do we deal with that? Are you you don't deal with that right now? I don't deal with that anymore because uh, now I focus on Mary's contracts. advice is quit Gosh. and go work at an amazing tech startup like <laughs> Ironclad. Just kidding. So how do you deal with it? This, this is, is my my answer is partnership, conversation, yeah. negotiation. And beneath all of that, the data, I was sitting with my head of trademarks yesterday and she's like, look, before I have a reaction to the price yep. increases I'm seeing, can the legal ops team show me the rate increases coming in from our top 10 or top 20 firms? Yep. So I can make, she can draw her response with data from a reasonable place of partnership. She needs those, those law firm folks to do the work and trademark. So you don't, you're not gonna shoot them down, but she, she's gonna come at it. This is so Libra, by the way, she's, she's a Libra. She's gonna come at it with, in a really measured, balanced approach. And she'll go back to them rather than react with no data, have a, a different number in mind, I, I'm assuming, and yeah. go from there. So partner, negotiate, use data. And it's okay to speak from the reality state with your yeah. firms. Like we're, we're in a What's budget crunch yeah. too. So how do we get to something together? Do we switch to a flat fee? That's do we switch, saying, switch, start getting creative, like get creative. The, time. the outcomes are different than just hourly uh, to get it all done. Yeah. So maybe one last question. One yeah. last question. I'm trying to pick the good one. <laughs> Someone, all right, this is a good one. And this happens to be my title and it's worth calling out the title. Jacob thinks the title of head of legal ops and tech would be great for his company. Can you explain how that role came to be? Jacob, that is my team's title. And I emphasize and tech because there is a legal IT as an in information tech staff component to my team. My company doesn't have the enterprise IT teams that I've had at other companies or that I've been at other companies, we're it. So we are finance, outside council management, ops, it's kind of intake project management triage. We are KM, knowledge management, we are tech. Mm -hmm. And that is why I'm an tech. There's an IT component. I have guys and gals on that team that will go and code an API yeah. and, and have fun doing it and know, and keep me honest when I start pretending I know what's going on inside an API. What a great team structure and scope that you have. Well, Mary, I got <laughs> yes. it from one of your slides long ago, but we really share such uh, the same ethos yeah. about how to solve in this space. We love the same scope. And and I called my team legal ops, technology, and strategy. Yeah. Because and I you, wanted to be sure that we did all those. Things. And you had people coding tech, yeah. for, for coding wise, and proprietary software that you license, like an ironclad. You need people in there to config in yeah. a low code, yeah. no code yeah. way. There it is, ops and tech roles of the future. All right, guys, I think that's it for today. We would love to do another one. So if you're interested, put it in the chat and we'll we'll be back for more. We'd love to take your questions and we'll see you in part four. See you out there. Thanks for joining.